crowd was like going super crazy and I literally said, move you pussies. And it like got the crowd going. And it was so funny because my friend Jay was sitting with Scott Vogel and Scott goes, did she just tell him to move pussies? He goes, that's so <laughs> sick. There's one thing this video needs. K-pop! Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. This is another episode of the Scoped Exposure Podcast. I am very excited to be sitting down with Lexi of Buffalo's Space. Thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you. Um, you know, I, I've i started to do some of these episodes as like a giving a bit of context of what caught my eye. And I think with uh, your guys' demo that came out um uh, I'm losing track with some of the years with the pandemic. I think the the demo initially came out in 2020, um, or it might have been at the top of the top of 2021. It right? was August. Oh, it was August. Okay. Yeah, we so, haven't been around for a full year. <laughs> that is wild to see how much uh, y'all have been doing. Um, so yeah, been getting a couple of years um, off of that, but yeah, like clearly have been doing a lot of things, uh, and I think. So another thing that kind of sparked the interest was hearing you uh, on on Jamie or Kay's podcast, friend of the show, and mm-hmm. you know just hearing some of the things that inspired you to get into hardcore. And I think um, you know seeing again like how new space is and how even new you are to hardcore. And I think that there's a lot of really cool things that we can talk about. So I'm uh, super honored and uh, thankful for you to be on the show today. Yeah, thank you. I'm really excited. I like went to school originally for like audio radio production. So like podcasting is something that I've always been kind of interested in. So like, Mm. I love being like, whenever I'm my friend as a podcast, I'm like, let me on. Like, I just want to hang. (laughs) So I'm all about this. Yeah. It, it, it is very funny on how we've started to, um, build the show where, you know, Jordan, who's our podcast producer is like, um, it's very reminiscent of like broadcast with, you know, cutting between different things. Um, and yeah, like I, I think that there's definitely people that like rush to like, Oh yeah, I love, you know, having the conversations documented and, you know, having to listen back. And some people are just not about that entirely and hate the sound of their voice and all those things. I think hardcore yeah. kind of helps, especially if you're a vocalist, you are like, mm-hmm. you hear yourself a little bit. So you're used to that a little bit more. Oh Yeah. I've gotten very used to my own voice. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, you know, before we get into some of the music chats and talking about space and Buffalo hardcore and all that good shit, uh, we have to do a Bev check to kind of yes. start the episode. So um, I'm very excited for what you're bringing to the show. Um, and it's tradition for the guests to go first. So tell me what you're going to be bringing. All right. So this is, um, I'm not really sure how to pronounce it. I think it's like Lote and it's peach water. It's Japanese. And oh. Whenever my, like, mom or me in general go to the Asian market, I try to get this stuff, and it only comes in a six-pack of cans, and I, like, chug it. So I've been holding on to the one last one for this. Wow. Feel feel yeah. very honored that it's been sitting in your fridge for so long and, oh, it's you know, so using good. all the self-control. So oh, yeah. it only comes at, in a set of six. Yeah, I think you can get them in, like, liter bottles, but, like, it's so hard to find it. And, like, every time in the Asian market, I'm, like, I don't want to be this, like, white person just, like, standing around. So I, like, try to get what I know I'm getting. So, like, I'm not trying to be in their way. And I'm, like, I'm just trying to mind my business. So just get what I need. Right. Yeah, you're, like, it's very it's very obvious I've, if I've been standing around looking, you know, side to side for too long versus, like, you get in and you get out with, yeah. with the goods. Yeah. No, that's that's great. So is there... Because I'm I'm always fascinated with all these different bevs that you know make its way to the show. So is there like other flavors, or is this like a one kind of stop shop? With I'm not 100 percent sure. My friend went to Japan like two years ago, and she was obsessed with peach water. And I eventually tried it like last year, and now I'm obsessed with it. So I've only tried the peach water. Mm, okay, so I'll have to check that out if I'm ever well, A, in Japan or, or stumble upon it, you know, somewhere here yeah. in North America. Um, just based on, like, you have some kind of divider in your room, it looks like. 
This is literally my mom's like divider. She works from home and I was like, mom, do, do, can I use that? Like, because <laughs> I just like, I'm in the guest bedroom right now because I have no desk in my actual room. I live with my parents for now because I'm going back to school and like trying to save money before I can like move back out. So yeah. like, I'm just using this in the guest bedroom right now. Yeah, no, that's totally fair. And apologies for uh, Lexi and all the people listening to my dogs bark in the background. Oh, you're um, fine. That's just the reality of this show at times. Um, Jor- Jordan's texting me in the middle of these. He's like, he's like Are, is your neighbor breaking into your house or what's happening? <laughs> um, but, you know, to, to showcase what Bev I'm going to be drinking. So, um, Lexi, I'm not sure how familiar with the show, uh, you are, but we have a couple beverage sponsors actually. Oh, um, okay. so I'm going to be drinking and I think this is the first time I'm checking this, uh, is new levels, blueberry sour. Oh my um, God. That sounds amazing. <laughs> I love blueberry sours in particular. Oh, okay. Well, I was like, I don't know, like, you know, everyone's got their favorite fruits and all that. I'm like, I'm not sure what what Lexi's about, but yeah, I'm glad I, you know, picked the oh right God. one. I worked at a brewery for a summer, like a couple years ago, and we had a blueberry sour in one point and it was so good. And I've never been able to find it again, but that sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. New level, which is the, uh, the brewery b- based in Calgary here that sponsors our podcast. Like I always say that their sour game is like unmatched. Like oh my God. the first of this series it's like this kind of same graphic but uh it's like a key lime kind of sour and then they did like a peach cobbler and then they did this blueberry version so all bangers like if that was you know if all those sours were a demo it would be a heater demo for sure but yeah shout out (laughs) to new level uh you know if space is ever up here in calgary you know i'll definitely i'll i'll have one of these saved in my fridge for you for a long long time oh my god i'm in (laughs) say less less. all right well you know before we get going cheers to you lexi really excited to do this podcast Cheers. yes i'm excited to be here yeah good good combo with the uh blueberry and then the peach coconut water yeah i don't know how they would do mixed together you know yeah i don't know blueberry and peach (laughs) that's i feel like they're two totally different things Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's Jordan, I really appreciate you sending me texts because Jordan's like, I wish I found out about these sours before I went straight. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. There, you know, there's there's bands that make you want to be straight edge, and then there's bevs that make you want to break edge. But you know, oh, yeah. that's a separate conversation. Uh we're here to talk about uh spaced and and things like that. Um, but before we get into that, Lexi, I always like to get a little bit of context about how people get into hardcore. Um you know, to kind of set the, uh, set the tone and get an idea of like, we all have our own unique pathway into this, but there's a lot of, uh, bridges and similarities, um, you know, despite age, uh, or geographical location or things like that. So tell me about kind of like your hardcore origin story and we'll kind of get started there. Yeah. Um, so I started dating my boyfriend in 2015, who's actually our drummer in space. Um, and he is from Buffalo and he showed me a lot of bands that like, I never really like listened to prior. So like, he told me, he's like, Hey, like you really should come to an every time I die Christmas show. And I was like, I mean, like hardcore really isn't for me, but like, I'll try it. And I went to a shit miss before it was to the season. So I think it was 2016 and this local band bungler was opening and I really liked them. That I feel like they might actually be the gateway into hardcore for me, but like being at the shipment show and like seeing every time I die do their thing, which RIP literally. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so, sorry to, to cut you off. Just as far as the no. time of recording this, it was like just yesterday that happened. I yeah. was like, is this going to just destroy the conversation or set a new tone for my podcast with Lexi? But yeah, go on. No, we can we can talk light about it. But, I'm sure we'll um, eventually get to that point. Oh, yeah. But that was like my first time ever being in a like a setting of hardcore. And I was like watching all of these people just like throwing themselves at each each other, jumping off the stage. And I was like, this is insane. This is so cool. (laughs) And I was just like so into it. And then Not Loose put out um, 
laugh tracks um, that spring. And that was another gateway into it. Um, counterparts were really big for me, turnstile. Mm. And then I think the one thing that actually got me into the point where I was like, I want to be a part of the hardcore scene. I want to be in a band was seeing Have Heart at the Palladium in Worcester. And it was the outdoor show. And that was just insane. I don't know if like you had friends that went. I don't know if you went, but like the Jordan energy... uh, went to not the outdoor show, but um, uh, the the one that happened before that. Yeah, the one that was the night before. I went to the outdoor show because my best friend was like, hey, do you want to come with me? I don't have anybody to go with right now. I know you don't really like listen to a lot of hardcore bands, but Vane is playing. And I was like, I love Vane. $30 ticket. Say less of it. <laughs> so I literally went just to see Vane, which is so funny to me because I love Have Heart now. And like I listened to them prior going to it, but like, and then that was the first time I saw One Step Closer, who have become like a very influential and important hardcore band to me. And I know mm. that they're still so young and like still like on the come up, but like I just like admire them and like what they're doing. And I just think that they're so cool. Like they're amazing. Mm. Yeah, no, there, there's a lot of great things to unpack there. Um, I think the first being like, uh, yeah, like obviously if you're in a relationship with someone, like there's like a, a natural transition there to kind of get exposure in that way. Um, but I do think it was like, you know, all the different like potential shows and bands, you know, doing, you know, not like monumental things, but like big enough things to, you know, steer the ship. Like, you know, you, you mentioned like knock loose's laugh tracks. Like that was like a huge record for them as a band, but also like for getting for it to be for it, for hardcore to make sense to people that didn't grow up with youth of today and gorilla biscuits and bad Brains yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then, you know, like, so there's all the, all these kind of different things. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really interesting on how like, half heart was maybe not a band that you were like i need to like this is such a monumental thing you were just kind of going like oh yeah i know about Bane and that band's sick but like was it just the the vibe of everyone who came from all over the world to go to that show that kind of like really resonated with you is that yeah. kind of what happened it was just like being there and just like seeing all of these people like and it wasn't even like it was just like local people from like Boston area. Like right. there were people from Canada. There were people from like all around the East Coast because they only did two shows on the East Coast, I think. Then they mm. did like Sound and Fury and maybe like one other show on the West Coast. But like it was just like crazy. And I remember seeing Hate, si Hate Five Six like like post like a picture being like 30,000 people like here to see if have heart. And I was like 30,000 people like. 30,000 people care this much about hardcore to come and like go into one random parking lot in Worcester, Massachusetts and just like have a good time. It was right. so hot that day. Like, oh, <laughs> not even joking. As soon as Half Heart ended, there was just like this giant torrential like thunderstorm and like it was just oh, humid and muggy and sticky. And like yeah. at one point I was like, I think I'm going to die like just of heat exhaustion. And, yeah, but it I, I was heard still so worth people, it. Yeah, it like I was kind of getting you kind of for the for the people that you know, there's like the fear of missing out, and then there's the people actually missing out. So I, being someone that didn't go to those shows and actually missing out on that, I you get the kind of the the telephone tag of a couple different like details about what's happening at that show. You know, someone who's like doing something crazy, uh, mosh wise or like you know, someone's at a turnstile show and you hear through the grapevine that someone took a shit. And then I'm like, where's the video proof? And then no one can give me a link. Um, but you know, to tie it back to the half heart show, um, it's, yeah, I definitely heard that it was extremely hot. It's in, in the middle of the summer. Um, and yeah, people are just like not hydrating and, you know, with this giant, uh, mountain of liquid death behind me, I'm like, why, <laughs> why is a rep not just there just handing shit out to people? But yeah, it's funny how, as soon as the band finished, it's just like, just the heavens opened up and all, all this yeah. down part came down. Well, like, I just remember the entire day. I'm like, it's going to start pouring and it's going to suck. And I'm going to be sticky and smelly and wet. And it didn't happen until like, 
we got to the car and I was like, how did we just miss this? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's wild. Like to see like how things can really like just come down to the wire at times. Like when, when Endgame played, we played a a show in Hamilton uh, at the beginning of December and, you know, we we had started a little bit later because we were trying to figure out, like, we we're borrowing all, like, amps and, and, and figuring out gear things. And mm-hmm. then we, like, did our set. And I think, like, five or ten minutes after, like, the cops showed up because it's kind of, like, in a DIY oh, kind of spot. So yeah. it was just, like, man, if we had started any later, it would be, like, cops coming in the middle of our set, which is, like, you know, having one of our closing songs being, like, like an a cab song it probably yeah. wouldn't have gotten even better than that uh but yeah it, it is like kind of funny uh you know being in the mix of that because yeah i'm sure people all day were like oh yeah it could rain any second and then it just never did yeah i was like literally watching the forecast and like it's gonna happen soon it's gonna happen soon and like right. as soon as it happened we were like already like in the clear and i was like oh my god yeah and let me tell you the shower after that was amazing <laughs> i was just like so sweaty like ugh. Nothing, you know, (laughs) I don't, you know, something that's not talked about enough is when you go to like a super long hardcore day or festival and Mm -hmm. you just have that like, just like you feel like you're just being like baptized in the shower just because you're just like so gross and just your bones ache and you can just like, you're like, whoa, like, yeah, just become a new person. That was a life changing moment. Not the half hard (laughs) show, but the shower after it. (laughs) Yeah, but they're connected to a degree. Yeah. Um, but, you know, going back to, you know, we're, we're kind of goofing around a little bit here. But I do think that, like, that that witnessing all those people coming together for one passion and one love in, like, in some ways is, like, that is super inspiring. And I think, like, like a lot of those jumping off points for people to start bands, for people to start record labels, for people to... Uh, just want to get more involved, whatever that means to them, is witnessing those like, yo, this is like this is something that I'm a part of, and like you know, mm-hmm. one of the most like pivotal shows for me, and I'm I'm trying to kind of make a little bit of a connection to to have art here. Um, uh, a band that was really uh, formative to me was seeing uh, Means' his last show, um, mm-hmm. and they were like. The I would say that they were like the Canadian melodic hardcore version of Have Heart to a degree. Okay. Definitely like not the same level, but I feel like seeing their last show and seeing, you know, it's in this church basement and like, you know, ceiling panels are bouncing back and forth and oh, PAs that's... are falling over. And it was just like, you like feel that like energy and like just want to expose yourself to more moments of that because you know that can't be replicated really anywhere else yeah exactly Mm -hmm. and like it's so funny because that like that was the moment where i was like i want to get more involved with hardcore and i literally went back to buffalo had a tattoo appointment and it was donnie who is the guitarist in space and i he every time i got a tattoo from him it was like we talked about horror movies and hardcore so I told him, I was like, yeah, I went to have heart show. It was super sick. Like, I really want to get more involved with the Buffalo hardcore scene. And he goes, start a band. And I was like, oh, dude, that's a lot of, <laughs> that's a lot. <Yeah. laughs> and he's like, no, I will start a band with you. And he also, his family owns a pharmacy and he works there. And my boyfriend, Dan works there. So him mm-hmm. and Dan started like laying down instrumentals and then they got, john and joe who's in space involved and then like next thing you know it was the pandemic and it's like july and you know when you have like that was like the time when everybody could like okay we can like ease up just a bit like hang out with like a small group of people and that was like the small group of people and we got together and we laid down instrumental and i remember we did it was think i am in your universe and i'm Mm -hmm. just sitting there and i'm like i have no idea what's going on like they're talking like, like music, like language and like talking about like recording stuff. And I've never been involved in like, recording. No, the riff is banana, banana. And you're like, I don't know what that means. Yeah. Like they're just like <laughs> talking about all kinds of stuff. And I'm just like sitting there. I'm like, sounds good, guys. Like, can't <laughs> wait. <laughs> um, but it was just like so cool because I was just sitting there. I was like, this is going to sound really good. <laughs> mm-hmm. No. And, and that's really cool. And I think like 
everyone in 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 any level of hardcore has had that first practice where they're like sitting in the room they're like i don't want to say anything because like i don't know how to you know like how, how we do this band like like oh this person wants to book us for a show okay how do we do that oh we got to figure out like yeah. like everything is new and and i love talking to people where you know we're like that that have those new experiences because for me it's like i've been in bands a long long time and it's been like the first don't come as frequently anymore so i love to be able to like you know talk with people about like kind of their stuff how, how their first are playing out in that like 2021 2022 kind of environment so mm -hmm. um you know you were kind of breaking down a little bit about how spaced you know, got going with, you know, uh, you know, Donnie just being like, yo, I'll start a band with you. And I think that's like super cool that people almost like, um, you know, it's, it's, I'm having flashbacks to when, uh, Kat from Scowl came on the podcast and, you know, mm -hmm. she was just with Ma Malachi and Malachi is like, no, we're starting a band. And it's like, oh shit, like are, we are doing this. And then it's like, you're in practice room. Like, oh, this is like coming to real life. So like, mm -hmm. bait, like, you know, whoever it is like you know what is like the one thing based off your experience maybe for like the people that do have that hesitant hesitant hesitancy of like well like how do i even start cuz i yeah. think a lot of people get mixed up with like they need to have things fully flushed out they need to have this giant social media following for someone to get like like why is it important to just start in your opinion so that conversation, like the original conversation about starting a band was summer of 2019. And we didn't release the demo until summer of 2021. Mm -hmm. So it was like two years. And there were definitely points where I was like, I don't know. I was like, I can't tell if Donnie is just like being Donnie and just like joking. Because like <laughs> he is very passionate about hardcore. Like is he always wanted people to start new bands to build the scene in buffalo so like mm. i couldn't tell if that was just him being excited and i was like yeah i'm in and then like nothing ever happened but then i would get texts from my boyfriend he'd be like dude like we finished a song and i'd be like oh my god this is happening mm. so like i guess my advice is like just start involving yourself with your local scene making friends in the scene and like i feel like a lot of people are always just like oh i can't ask so and so to be in my band because i already need a man Nine mm. times out of ten, they're more than happy to be in another band. Literally, yes. I know so many people in, like, four <laughs> bands, and, like, they're just having the time of their life. Mm -hmm. So as long as you can, like, find at least one person that's, like, willing to actually do it, then you can just, like, build from there. Mm -hmm. And then just, like, make connections, making more friends in your scene. Like, even going to, like, the city over. So, like, Buffalo and Rochester, like, are an hour apart. Like, maybe there's someone in Rochester that wants to play in a band in Buffalo. Or, mm -hmm. like, someone in Buffalo that wants to play in Rochester. So, it's, like, it's so easy to go into another local scene that's close by and being, like, hey, let's let's do something. Right. Yeah. No, that, that's a great point. And, you know, like, granted, like, we have people from all over the world that listen to this podcast. So, you know, there's uh, people that have varying degrees of geographical pros and cons. So, yeah. there's people that live in California who are, like, oh, yeah, the neighboring scenes are, like, there's, like, five. And then there's people in Western Canada or, like, even something like Australia that are, like, the closest scene is 12 hours driving away. Yeah. So, there's, like, a couple things there. But I do think that what I'm hearing is is kind of one of two things, like, kind of seeking that out that involvement and not being uh shy about like asking the questions of like you know trying to do that and i think the people that are have been around the block a lot longer that have uh you know are a little bit more established in hardcore and have played in a bunch of different bands to actually just like see a spark of interest and then just grab those people by the shirt and pull them into the yeah into the universe that's literally what donnie did with everybody in space <laughs> so <laughs> funny like i feel like me, John, Joe, and Dan all got on hardcore at the exact same time. And Donnie's like, okay, you, 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 and you. And just right. like put us all together. And I think that's what makes space so cool is because we're taking like all these different like musical interests and just like throwing it into one thing. And that's how we get our sound. Mm -hmm. And because like, don't get me wrong, we all have bands like the five of us that we all really enjoy. But like, I listen to K pop. Like, they don't listen to K pop. Like, 
John loves the Beatles. Like that's his thing. Or like Joe's really into shoegaze. Dan grew up on punk. Like it's just all of these things. And so we mm-hmm. just throw it into one thing and then that's how we get space. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think being able to play to your influences in a very like genuine way really allows your music to just have that like one edge that isn't like, I'm just like, my band is just trying to be the next earth crisis or my band is just trying to be the next or like not even like trying to be the next band, but just like, that's what you are writing. You're playing in like the hate breed field or things like that versus like hate breed is an influence, but I also really like all these other things. And some of that might, might even be outside of like hardcore altogether. Yeah, exactly. Like, so, I feel like, like that's the thing about hardcore is that like, if, if you pull influences from other genres, it's it'll make a sound that has never been heard by the scene. Like, like I feel like Scowl is like a really good example because like just like Kat's like vocal, like her vocals are just so like different from anything I've ever heard from any hardcore yeah. band ever. And I think that is just so cool. Like I really admire her. I like think that what scowl is doing is kind of what space wants to be doing so like mm. all, all of us are just like ah they're so cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i think um you know when I, when i think of punk hardcore like that kind of uh that that kind of strain of it like i think cat's vocals really add a new dimension in that space versus just like the not like the classic oi kind of sound but like you know mm-hmm. there's there's stuff when i think punk hardcore my mind goes to some like a certain place and scowl plays in like a, an adjacent field of that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and, you know, to kind of tie it back to other things, I think it's just a matter of like, you know, not trying to push something because you think it's trendy or popular or will get like the attention that you want, but just being like, well, this is true to me. So I'm going to do that. Yes, exactly. And like, I remember, when we started like doing like some demos, like of just instrumentals, like Donnie, um, he's like, is good. Not, I, they're friends. He's friends with like Andy Williams. And like, he showed that like him, the demos. And he was like, this is something that could do something for Buffalo hardcore. Like, this is something the scene has not heard. And he's right. like, keep running with this because this could go somewhere. Mm. And like Andy Williams is like, just, <laughs> the like dude in buffalo hardcore at least to me that i'm like okay the man says it we gotta do it <laughs> <laughs> yeah we we got the the buy-in from at least him so that's probably a good call yes and i'm waiting for the door to open up or not <laughs> um that being said um you know maybe we could just talk about just like the response that that space has gotten because i think um you know, I obviously like I am someone that always is on the hunt for. Hold on one sec. Hi guys. Oh, there's some doggies. Hi. Yeah. Yes. Very exciting. <laughs> um, you know, so I'll I'll finish this question while while I'm asking you and petting the, these dogs. But you know, I I saw the genuine excitement not only from you guys but also from like lots of friends and and different things of like, um, hey, um, just like how things have have pushed sorry they've been like they've been on my on my nerves today oh um so let me let me just re-ask that question so so you guys put out the demo in 2021 and i think through donnie and just seeing the genuine excitement from you from you guys it wasn't like this expected like we're going to drop this and then our lives are going to change. It was like, yeah. we like this music. We're going to drop it. And then it was like, kind of went for further than, you know, you were even hoping for. So talk to me about like that, especially how that resonates with, you know, your, your very first band and, um, and what that means for you as an individual. I feel like the actual intention of space was just to like have another band in Buffalo hardcore to like mm-hmm. play shows and then next i like remember the day that it came out i was at work and i'd never been in a band john joe dan and donnie have all been in bands so like Mm. they're used to like 
releasing something and getting feedback. So I kept seeing like my friends reposting it and I was like, oh, that's awesome. Like, I'm glad my friends support me. Like, love that. And then I remember, I think Donnie texted the band group chat and was like, this is kind of insane how many people are paying attention. And I was like, is it? Like, I'm not sure. Yeah, and, I have no reference point, so. <laughs> yeah, and I want to say like, in the first day we had over a hundred streams on it Mm -hmm. and like we were brand new band just put out music like only have promo pics nothing else never played a show (laughs) and we played our first show a couple weeks after we released the demo and it was just like in buffalo with uh two local bands smash and grab and exhibition shout out Mm -hmm. to them and it was super cool because like i had my friends come out who had never been involved in hardcore And I was happy to have them come out because I feel like I was exposing them to hardcore. And like from then on, it just like got crazier and crazier. And then like Jamie um, asked me and Donnie to be on his podcast. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Cause like Jamie has like had some cool people on his podcast. And then we were playing a show in Cleveland and I was like, what now a town show. And then like, it just went crazy out of nowhere. I really have no other way to explain it other than that. Yeah, I definitely think um, it was definitely cool to see. Look at these scoundrels just leaving and then coming back. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I think there... I wanted to ask because I think a lot of the the way that the demo kind of sparked and like kind of went the distance was very similar on my experience with uh with the end game demo and um you know like this podcast is about you and your band and and you know this is just a quick anecdote about about mine to to make a connection but you know very so like i was camping the day that we dropped it and i'm like you know like on like you know the 3g or 5g in the middle of like you know the mountains and I'm like yeah. trying to get it up and then yeah it was just like you know as I got back into the city it's like oh my gosh like people like from all over and then like certain people that I admire and look up to are sharing it I'm like uh I have no business being in your Spotify search but apparently I am so I think that it is like something that I'm noticing especially with a lot of newer bands in like again that like kind of like the time that hardcore kind of took a turn via like the pandemic i'll use that as like a marker but like Mm -hmm. now that like hardcore is like back and there's still things to consider but like i think bands have this ability to have this like jumping off point that like i don't think even end of the uh 2000 the 2010s like bands didn't that wasn't apparent. It wasn't Mm -hmm. like you couldn't drop a demo and then have it be as explosive as it is now. And I think that's like, it's, it's a double edged sword to a degree. Cause I think it's a, like an expectation that some bands have when they drop something and then it doesn't catch fire. But I do think that it is super cool for bands to like put out a great product and then be able to do the cool shit that, you know, everyone in the band wants to. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, it it is like really interesting on how things play out um in in that world cuz like it's the hardcore market just decides what's sick and then shares it a ton on Twitter and then it's kind of game yeah. over at that point. It all has to do with social media, honestly. Like I remember like the coolest thing and this is so funny is like I Dan had access to the Instagram account and like jokingly sent the demo to um I can't think of his name. One of the members of Newfound Glory, Chad. And oh, like, okay. like, hey man, like, love Newfound Glory. Like, we all love you. Like, here's uh my band's demo. And like just left it at that. And he's like, Yeah, this is really good. And he posted on a story. We were like, and I was driving and I get a call from Dan. And I was like, what's up? And he's like, uh, Chad Ball just posted us on his story. And I was like, Whoa. I was like, this is <laughs> this is something that I need to like sit down for. Yeah. You're like, let me pull over real quick and just process. Yeah. I I was like five minutes from my house. So I like sped home and I just like was sitting in my driveway. Like, Oh my God. That's wild. Uh, Yeah. yeah. It was so weird. Yeah. I think, I think that there's a, a, there's kind of like a switch that you make the deeper that you get into it where, yeah. Like there, there are people that I'm like, like low key, like 
just being such a fanboy when I get to like have an opportunity to have someone so on the podcast. But at the end of the day, like these are just all people that still had those first experiences when, you know, their band was first dropping a demo or like, you know, like going to their show for the first time. Um, but I do think that it is wild that like you're able to like, you know, I'm sure that like the DM that was sent to, uh, you know, Mr. Newfound Glory wasn't like, oh, we're doing this so he shares yeah. it. It was like, I'll just throw this fish line to, out into the sea and see what happens. And then, you know, you never know what's going to bite. and when. Yeah, literally. Like, I, I just like have no words to describe <laughs> it. It was just so weird and like very cool, like a very right. cool thing to happen. But I feel like that just like set the tone for what was happening. And we were all just like, did that just happen? Like, right. is that what's going to happen to us now? Would you say that's the craziest person that you know has listened to uh, your music? Oh, yeah. I would say okay. that that's <laughs> probably it. Yeah. It's and it probably on like. The first day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Set the bar really high very early. <laughs> yeah. It really did. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, that's really funny. So, you know, to fast forward a little bit, uh, you guys recently put out two new songs uh, through New Morality Zine. Um, so, so I'm really happy to see that, um, you know, acquisition, I'll, I'll call it that. Um, and yeah, like, was that something where, you know, off of the demo, I think every band is like, especially that gets that kind of, um, oh shit, there, there, there's people that are paying attention to this more than just mm -hmm. our friends. So how did you guys navigate like the quote unquote following up of those, uh, of those songs with, uh, you know, the two that you did with Numerati? I feel like um, we kind of just like sat down and like laid down instrumentals and then we wrote the lyrics and we didn't really like think anything of it. Like we, we were happy with them. And then when I started to do vocals, I was like, after finishing, like, I think it, the first song we did was not like you. And after we finished it and we were listening through, I was like, I think I like this more than the demo. And I was like, already. And then we did Bad Energy, and I was like, I think I like this more than not like you. And I was like, so is it only just going to get better? Which is good, because I'm glad that, like, we are going up and not just, like, at a plateau. Like, I feel like we're just, like, getting in our band space, like, our practice space, and just, like, messing around. And then somehow it turns out good, and then we write lyrics, and it just put it all together and then we're like, Oh my God, this is really sick. Like, this is so cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, no, it, it's good that you guys are already like looking at like trying to push the env envelope and evolve the band, not only like, you know, aesthetically, you know, with different things, but also with uh, the music itself. Cause mm -hmm. I think it's very easy for bands to like do something and it catches a little bit of attention and hype and then do the same thing again yeah. versus like okay how do we like show a different side and how do we like evolve and you know like every change that a band has musically needs to be like thoroughly mapped out like i'm mm -hmm. i'm thinking back when i had uh, jeremy from comeback kid on the podcast a huge band for me growing up in yeah in, in winnipeg but like every record even though the band has like changed so much over the years still has like an olive branch of like you know, it makes sense that they went this way and then left and then right and, and all and all of that. So, you know, that it feels a lot more like the the decision making feels more like like, oh, like we can't fuck this up off of yeah. getting like such an attention. But like it, it's it's really encouraging uh, to hear that you guys are already like, no, we're we're very down to help like push the boundaries uh of what this band is is known for and expand mm -hmm. that like i feel like when we just like start writing it's always just us like having fun which i feel like is probably my advice to any band is just like to have fun with it obviously that's easier said than done but yeah. like it really does come down to us just like jamming and then we're like oh that sounds kind of cool can you do that again just like oh can you tweak this and do this instead and like mm -hmm. i remember i think it was not like you when we were like finishing up that John and Donnie were like just laying down like demos before we went into the studio and John was like we should put cowboy cowbell on this and Donnie's like mm, as much as I want to say that that's a good idea I don't think it is 
And I was like, you know what? Maybe it's kind of cool. And I remember we tried it. And we were like, okay, maybe cowbell isn't ever hardcore. <laughs> but that's like the thing is like, we'll just be sitting there. And we're like, what if we put this in here? And then like, if it sounds good, it sounds good. If it doesn't, we scrap it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, like for you guys to experiment with cowbell and then seeing a band as big as Turnstile still have like, I think Daniel has two cowbells on his drum set now. Yeah, um, probably. That sounds about yeah. right. <laughs> I know I know that they're at uh different uh pitches. So one's higher and one's lower. But um no, I think I think it's sick because I think it's cool to I think it's really cool to see how what hardcore is right now musically where it's like super experimental and there's so much love for all like veins of, you know, all the different hardcore stuff like whether it's, you know, youth crew or like metalcore or if it's like kind of just something super weird i think it's like people are down to see to a see that at a live show b mosh to it c Mm -hmm. support those bands and and talk to people about it and i don't and you know like again there's there's people that have you know way more years of hardcore uh experience and like decades even on me and i think you know, I, I, there's some blinders there, but I do think that like, as far as a whole, I think it's kind of such a great time to, to be in hardcore right now. Yeah. Like whatever we write, Donnie always says, it's like the kids want a two-step. If they can two-step to this, then it's good. <laughs> so we're always like trying to get a nice two-step beat in there for them. Oh yeah. You, yeah. That's yeah. You, you gotta make sure you gotta have, uh, at least a two-step beat, you know, no matter what yeah. kind of band, uh, you know, genre that you're doing. Um, so speaking of that, you know, you're the vocalist of, of this band. Do you, you know, and, and you're kind of getting in the groove and, you know, figuring out like your, your stage banter and like all those kind of things. What's your, like, do you have like a Lexi, like mosh banter or mosh call that you're like, this gets everyone moving for sure. So this is going to be a funny story. So when we opened for Buried Alive in December, it was like the Tid the Season pre-show. Right. And I remember like the crowd wasn't going super crazy. And I literally said, move you pussies. And it like got the crowd going. And it was so funny because my friend Jay was sitting with Scott Vogel. And Scott goes, did she just tell him to move pussies? He goes, that's so (laughs) sick. And I was just like, all right. So I guess I'm going to start doing that. Usually I'm just like side to side. Like I want to see you fucking move. Like nothing yeah. too crazy. I feel like I try to get like my Brendan Murphy out there. Um, yes. He's always like, move you motherfuckers. You fucking stupid bitches. Like, yeah, I always like try to kind of be like that, but a little bit toned down. Cause I'm like, I'm not trying to be too mean. I can't be like that yet. Like, yeah. let me just throw in a nice little like jab at people. But I Brendan's feel like a move little you bit pussies. Yeah. Well, yeah, I've never, I've never heard that, and it, it's, it's hilarious hearing how Vogel, you know, Mister yeah. Turner himself, is like, "Yo, that's sick. I'm into that." <laughs> I know. I remember I said because John, our bassist, told me he's like, "You should call the crowd pussies," like right before our set, and I was like, "Okay, I'll do it." And after he's like, "You actually did it," and I was like, yeah. "I can get away with it." I was like, "If yeah. I did it, I don't think they can." <laughs> yeah you're like if anyone should be saying it at this show it should be me <laughs> yeah i was like i'll take one for the team i'll throw it out there if it yeah. doesn't go well it doesn't go well yeah yeah it's funny that you bring up uh brendan murphy's uh you know mosh banter um because i've gotten to see counterparts a number of different times and i feel like it's you never know what you're gonna get with him mm-hmm. when it comes to a show yeah. like it could be like you know the most ridiculous things i'm trying because i've only I've seen them a bunch, but I've only filmed them once. And I think that they had a, um, no, that was their guitar player that said that. He said something like, he he, he was making like a welcome to the jungle reference. Oh my he was God. Like, You're in the jungle, baby. You're gonna die. I was like, wait, what is happening right now? Was that at one of their holiday shows when they like had those no, shows? No, this was, okay. they were on tour I with. I feel like he said that there. Oh, yeah. Like, I'm sure it's probably something that, you know, that that was like, I'm saying it this tour at this part in the song or whatever. Mm-hmm. It is. Uh, but that was their uh, former guitar player, Blake, who said that. But, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. It's Brendan's a funny individual. It was like 
I had him on the podcast for season one, and and we've been talking about bringing him back for season two because it's just the man can talk about anything, and it's and he can still spin it to be entertaining for some yeah. reason. <laughs> he also recently got into K-pop, so I'm like the K-popification of hardcore is oh, beginning. Oh, interesting, and I, do, I love it. I do have some K-pop questions for you a little bit later. All right, um, if if you're okay with that. Um, oh, I'm ready. Uh, but you know, as you know, I, I think that's a, a great kind of thing. You know, we're talking, we talked a little bit about Buffalo hardcore. Um, you know, it, it's funny with like, um, is it buried dreams or bear? No, it's buried alive. Yeah. Those are two different bands though. I think, yeah. Buried yeah. alive <laughs> is Scott's band from like the nineties. Pre terror. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would always see like Tara came up uh, through Western Canada and played a, a number of shows. And when I was watching videos kind of getting ready for the I would always see like the Buffalo Sabres jersey that he would always wear. And oh, yeah, yeah, it, it was just always that thing where it's like I don't really know of many bands that were from there outside of um, of that one. And every time I die. So it's really cool to hear to kind of have that. Uh, exposure to like a, a more local level band that kind of goes into some of the other things. So like, um, you know, m- maybe one of the questions about like Buffalo hardcore with like, you know, the timeliness of like every time I die call- calling it quits at this point, like I've seen a ton of people being like, really like this hit me really hard. Cause like, you know, like my, the drummer in my band is like, and every time I die, Stan, like he's mm-hmm. like, he like I got on a, on a call with him. Like when that was happening, I was like, bro, are you OK? <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, as far as like Buffalo is concerned, like, you know. How has everyone been dealing with that? So it sucks because every time I die, it was like a gateway band for me into hardcore. And like I found two really good friends out of it, like all of my almost all of my friends like have gotten into hardcore because of every time I die. Mm -hmm. And I always say to uh, my one friend from New Jersey, because she came to to the season in 2019 or 2018. And I told her, I was like, to the season is so important to me because it brings so many people to Buffalo and exposes people to the city and also exposes people to the hardcore scene here. And it just always kind of felt like a nice little like, coming home thing for like everybody like whether they were from buffalo or not like whether they were from the u.s or not like there are people from all over the world just in like one venue like to see one band Mm. and it just was always like the nicest energy and i'm glad i went to to the season this year because i remember going into it i was like i feel like this is the end and i was like i gotta make the most of it and i did so yesterday when they announced it, I unfortunately did not, I wasn't surprised. I felt like it was going to happen. And like, they have been around for 20 years and they have been doing it. And right. like, not every band's going to last forever. So like, I feel no like band I lasts kind forever. of, oh yeah. So I feel like I kind of just accepted it before it actually happened. And then when I saw like the tweets, I was like, okay, it's fine. We're going to move on from here. Yeah. Maybe in a week I'll be really upset. We're not sure yet. Um, <laughs> you're like listening but, back to this podcast episode and a little tear just comes down. You're like, <laughs> yeah, because like every time I die is so important to me. And like mm. without them, I would not be here right now, like on mm. this podcast. So they and they're such an influential band and like they give out like give back to the city and the scene and like bring so many cool bands into Buffalo. And like, for that, I'm so thankful for them and like right. what they've done. Um, I hope that they like can end on a kind of good term and like, maybe that will be like, Oh, maybe in like a few years or like 10 years from now, there will be a reunion show. But like, I don't know. I'm just like, it's very bittersweet. Yeah. More bitter than sweet. <laughs> Very few bands are at the scale as Every Time I Die was um, to be able to do a show that is like essentially like branded around their existence. Right. Yeah. Um, And not I would say most of those bands of that level don't want to do that anyways. Like, you know, no one like I'm sure 
knocked loose or turnstile have kicked around the idea of like what if we did an annual show that like did that but like it's not a common thing but to see that year over year that they would do something that's very special for buffalo and bring like knocked loose and hey five six to come film it and like mm-hmm. i think this past year um uh spirit box which is like uh yeah you know, bill who came on on the show um it was their first time playing that so i have like mad respect for any band of any like uh notable magnitude that can like do that especially for like an underdog scene i think that's like super super commendable and i wish that more bands did that oh yeah like it's just like they were such an important band to not only the scene in Buffalo, but like the city. And I feel like Western New York in general. So like Rochester and maybe even like Syracuse, like they were doing it because they wanted to play music, not for any money. Like I believe they were still touring in vans for like a good a while, probably before Low Teens came out. And I saw a tweet today that said like when they're on tour with Coheed and Cambria and they were like playing like amphitheaters outdoor venues they went five hours out of the like tour like on off day to play a show with trail of lies in syracuse so like if it says anything about the band it says that they just want to play music and have fun and get their fans to come out and have a good time yeah yeah and and, you know i i think both opportunities of playing a an a, like a stadium with Cody and Cabria and like a DIY spot with Trail of Lies both sound sick, both for different reasons, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that is so cool to be to be a band that gets to a certain level, but still likes to do like the surprise sets that like people mm-hmm. find out the day of or like take out a band. Like, I think it's so cool to see like code orange taking out dying wish on this uh, next tour of those. Cause mm-hmm. like that is like an up and coming, that's kind of a matchup that I'm like, didn't expect, but I'm very happy to see. So yes. I, I appreciate when bands come from this world and they don't forget that they came from this world. Like, not to lose, like, and I know that I think all of the members have tweeted, like, basically, like, without Every Time I Die, there would be no Knock Loose. But, mm-hmm. like, Every Time I Die, I took a chance with them. And now they're probably one of the biggest bands in the scene right now. And they're still just, like, getting bigger and bigger every day. Right. So, and Every Time I Die showed me Knocked Loose. And, like, Knocked Loose is a very important band to me. And it's just, like, a trickle-down effect of, like, this band showed me this and this band showed me this. And it's just, like, I feel like it always comes back to every time I die at the top. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And no, I think it's very cool. And, you know, I, I don't like, I'm not as educated on some of the behind the scenes of like what kind of happened, but it sounded like, you know, anyone who is like probably local to the Buffalo area kind of maybe saw some writing on the walls. And I hope that, you know, things can come to some kind of closure for a lot of those people and, Mm -hmm. you know, relationships can be mended. And, you know, because like the last thing that I hate to see is when bands break up and it's for like really shitty reasons and people and people say things and then relationships are broken for years on end. So, again, I don't want to speculate or kind of add any um, ignorance to kind of the mix of things. But, you know, I I hope that. You know, all in all, I think it's very clear that um, that every time I die was like an influential force in in the hardcore space and especially in Buffalo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Lexi, you you are super tall. Right? Yes, <laughs> I'm five eleven. <laughs> I was like, I knew, I was like, what's the the very hard transition into a totally different topic? Um, <laughs> I love it. Because it was like I was looking, I always like kind of just just peruse my guests' um, Instagram kind of before jumping on. I was like, Lexi just seems to be taller than most of her fr- or or their friends and all these different things. So, oh yeah, like how has that been? Has that been a weird thing? As like people not expecting you to be that tall when you start like you know going to shows and doing these different things. Um, I don't think so. I haven't had anything happen to me yet. Um, I'm like so used to my height at this point. Like, obviously, I've been this tall for like years. Right. Um, and like in high school, I was the tallest person like in my school. So like, 
just being able to have friends that are like my height or taller is just like nice for once. And it was so funny. So we played a show in Rochester last week, I mm-hmm. think two weeks ago. And I wore like this plat these platform converse that I got for Christmas. Okay. And they make me definitely over six feet. <laughs> and the the stage was like already high up. Like I had a very narrow amount of space to like move around. And I remember one time, like in the middle of the set, I like had my eyes closed and I look and I'm like barely like on the stage. Like I'm like, oh my God, I'm about to fall off and like look like a loser. This tall giant just like falling onto the floor. <laughs> like I caught myself, but like so far I haven't gotten any like, whoa, you're really tall. Like comments. It's, I feel like, especially in the promo pictures, like I'm probably, I think I'm the second tallest in the band, maybe third. So you can gauge that I am tall. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. I think it's like you can gauge that that you are tall, but I don't think it's like so over like like someone who I think is overly tall is like Benny from Tsunami. Like when I saw him <laughs> in person for the first time, I'm like, bro, can you share how tall you are with like some people that are maybe like under five, three? <laughs> like, yeah. He's like, and it's very... so funny because there's like there are like vocalists in hardcore who are short and like mm-hmm. I just don't expect it. Like I remember. I was seeing Drain at the church in Philly and it was a floor show. Like they weren't on the stage. And I was like, I can't see him. I was like, there's so many (laughs) tall people here. And I was like, but I can tell he's having so much fun up there and I love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It it is funny. The, um, the, the dynamics of playing on the floor versus like that perfect stage height where it's like just enough that you can get up and, and still stage dive. And then there's some where you like have to really commit and you're like putting your hands on like a treasure chest as like a five-year-old and you have to like really put yourself up. Um, But yeah, there's, there's some funny things there. I was just like, maybe I'll just throw the tall question in and see how Lexi uh, responds to that. (laughs) Like as a performer, I prefer floor shows, Mm. but as a concert goer, I would love a stage. I need to be able to stage dive because otherwise I'm like struggling to get up and like have someone lift me up. And it's just so awkward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm not trying to like step on gear. Yeah. There's always been the weird thing where it's like, there's like one little staircase or one platform or yeah, you're like jumping onto someone's pedals. You're like, sorry. And then you're like running. Yeah. Um, Yeah. But uh, so, um, you know, you, you brought up being a big K-pop fan. Um, Mm Mm-hmm. So tell me, has that always been uh, apparent in your life or like, you know, what was was, what was the specific K-pop seed that got planted for you? So I also really like anime and -hmm. I feel like there's just like this timeline where it's like you either really like anime and you get into K-pop or you really like K-pop and you get into anime. I feel like they're just like cousins with each other. And which came first? Anime came first. Okay. And I remember because like a lot of K-pop groups actually like sing theme songs for like animes. And I remember I saw one and it was for this one group. And I was like, then I started getting into BTS. And like that was in the beginning of 2019. And, like I just very casually listened to like a handful of like different K-pop groups. And then the pandemic hit and you're just alone at home. You have nothing else to do. Next thing you know, you're like watching hours of K-pop music videos and you know all of the <laughs> members and like you're singing all the songs and you're like kind of learning the choreography and you're like, what is going on? And then it's 2022 and you're like, oh my God. That's so funny. Yeah. yeah. It's I think I think either people indulge I like I love hearing the different indulgences of like what people really got into within those first few weeks of like actual lockdown. And oh like, my god, they actually couldn't leave their house. They couldn't go to work. And they were like, you know, for some people, it was like booted up cod and didn't leave their room for seven days. And then there was people who were like went down different rabbit holes on YouTube. And for you, it sounds like it just like, all right, I am just gonna like become a is is it a k-popper a k-pop stan k-pop stan okay i'm like i don't want to i don't want to get canceled (laughs) by any like k-pop people saying something incorrect no you're good like my one friend they're really into k-pop and so i would listen to different groups that they suggested to me and one of them was nct 127 
and they released an album I think in like the first week of quarantine and I watched a music video and I was like that that uh member is kind of cute and then I was like what's his name and I was like wait there's nine of them I know all of their names I was like and I know their entire discography and now I have so many albums and it just was like I feel like I just blink and it's just oh I know everything now <laughs> like I just mm-hmm. have so much information in my brain that I don't need Okay. Well, no, th- that's great for this next question. So as someone who is like beyond, like Jordan texted me, is like, this is Spencer's boomer moment. Like, because I don't know any K pop. Um, oh, but fine. if you, if you had to give me like the beginner, the intermediate and the expert level of like different K pop, you know, like give me the, you know, the starter, the like appetizer, and then the main course of like different artists. Um, okay. You know, so, and, and I say that, not for someone to have a blitz, but you know, there might be different people listening to this podcast that are like, I kind of like K-pop or like, I love K-pop. Tell me the really obscure ones. So walk okay. me through those three. So I feel like the two, cause you can either be really into boy groups or you can be really into girl, girl groups, or you can be like in the middle, but I feel like there's always one you favor over the other. And okay. for the boy groups, like the big one, I feel like is BTS. Like they're huge. It's mm-hmm. crazy. And then for girl groups, this might be a controversial one, but I would say twice. Um, okay. That's Why the one that Brendan Murphy really likes. <laughs> um, but they, I feel like those are the two for like beginners. Like if that's where you want to start, start with either BTS or twice or both, whatever you want. And is, then is the girl group controversial because they're overhyped or is there something else there? So I would say black pink is bigger than them. Oh, okay. Um, I just personally like Twice more, and I feel like it gets more people into K-pop. But like, okay. to each their own. If you like Blackpink, you like Blackpink. So if yeah. that's something that you listen to, sure, I'll throw them in the mix. Um, <laughs> sure. and I would actually probably say NCT would be also a beginner one because this is this is gonna be a lot. So there's NCT, and under it, so there's like 23 members. And, in one band. And so then they break it off into groups. Okay. And so there's NCT 127, NCT Dream, and Wavy. And there's different <laughs> members in those groups. And then, like, every now and then they do an album together. Oh. It's this, so this is much a, information. <laughs> this is, like, this is where it's, like, I... Obviously, someone that doesn't listen to hardcore is, like, what do you mean there's, like, side projects? Like, stuff that's, like, so common in, mm-hmm. in, in when you're so deep in it. But, like... I'm I'm trying to process that there's a group that sometimes does an album together and then there's groups underneath that, not all named after the same group, and one is called Wavy. Yeah. <laughs> Just processing that. But I, I I'm 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 really enjoying this this info blast. So Wavy is called Wavy because they're the Chinese subgroup and apparently like Korea and China aren't super happy with each other, I think. Gotcha. So they okay. named it Wavy, so it's not NCT, but it is NCT. Got you. So that's so it's like, like the starters. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but like, okay, so, obviously yeah. 23 members is a lot. So maybe <laughs> BTS might be for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm definitely going to check out one, one of the other ones. Cause like, I think, I think if you're pl- plugged into any amount of pop culture, you've probably heard of BTS and yeah. like probably saw the, the McDonald's meal like oh, yeah. from them. Um, okay. So, you know, we're, we're starting off. And then people can skip ahead if they're like, I don't want to hear about K-pop. But tell me about some of like the more intermediate and expert stuff that like this is for like the true fans if you're about it. So like I feel like intermediate, there's like newer groups that have come out in the past few years. And that's like there's Stray Kids, um, ATs, ITZY, um, I feel and TXT. ITZY is a girl group and I really like them. Um, maybe even Monsta X, they've been around for a long time, but they just like haven't blown up as much as like some other K-pop groups. But those would I I would suggest those for anybody who is like, all right, I've listened to BTS, I've listened to Twice, give me some other groups. So I would throw those in the mix. And then for expert level, this is where it's like, how do you even know all these people? They just like put out a song two weeks ago. Because <laughs> like um, there's Stacy who like they just came out in a, like a year ago. There's Ive, which just came out like a month ago. Um, Extinary Heroes, they're like an actual K-pop band. So they play okay. their own instruments. Um, 
oh man, I don't really listen to a lot of the newer ones. I think one just came out. It's like Kep Warner. It's like spelled K-E-P one E-R. And they just released like six songs and they're bangers. Mm. Um, so like that's so where I would say the expert level is, is where you're like keeping up with these new groups that are coming out. Mm. And I right. just like happen to stumble upon them. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So that makes sense. It, it's it's no different than like someone in the hardcore space that like found this obscure demo through band camp and the bands from like like fucking germany or something or something yeah. like that and it's like how have you not heard this band yeah. um but it's just a little bit different so that's interesting how it's not about how much but how obscure it is mm -hmm. and how recent it is yeah and like while it sounds like i know a lot there are people who know groups that i have never heard of <laughs> like it just gets deeper and deeper. It's just like a black hole of information. And mm. I just kind of like try to keep out of it as much as I can, but like I usually fall in. So, mm -hmm. right. Okay. Well, I, I have one more K pop re related question, and then we'll jump back to some of the, uh, the okay. other hardcore related things. And this is a tough one. So I hope you're ready for it. Oh, God. Okay. What is the most overrated K pop group? And what is the most underrated right now? Oh my god, I'm gonna sound so controversial. <laughs> Personally, I think Blackpink is overrated. Um, they have some bangers, and I think that they're all very talented, but I feel like people give them like I feel like people hype them up as more than they are. But that's just sure. my opinion. Yep. Keeping that out this there. is opinions only. <laughs> sorry, any Blackpink fans. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm um, sure there's probably like one or two. I know. And I feel like I'm pissing them off right now. <laughs> um, That's okay. Most people are like, I have no idea who this, who this yeah. group is. So yeah. Um, And then I would say a group that doesn't get enough recognition is Everglow. It's a girl group and they have this one song called first and oh my God, it is like, I listen to it like once a day and it came out in May last year. And I just like, have not stopped thinking about it since <laughs> damn okay well i will I, at the very least check out that song specifically oh it's so good it's so okay. good um so so jumping back to a couple other things um you know i i was reading some of the you know other you know i was listening to jamie's podcast and then i was looking at some of the other interviews that you did um and one thing that really caught my eye and you can break this down as much or as, as little as you want but uh you were talking in an interview about like um, one of the main reasons that space started was to give more rep representation and diversity in hardcore and how if it's hard being a non-white male and I'm just reading a quote here. Yeah. Um, it's hard being a non-white male trying to put yourself out there and making a band because it's so intimidating. So focusing on that word intimidating, like what is that intimidation in like like how do you see that being played out where someone like myself who's a white cis male like maybe is like totally ignorant to or is just not seeing that if it does that question make sense no yeah that's good um yeah. i feel like and i think i can speak for a lot of non-men that like sometimes guys are scary and it's hard going in, it's scary going into a room and you like look around and you're like there's only dudes in this room I was mm. and like it's a sausage fest like I feel like unfortunately I've been to like a good handful of hardcore shows and I look around and like I think I'm the only girl here and then you just like feel uncomfortable and like you kind of feel like you're being judged and I know it's probably all in our head but like this is just like how I feel and like if you go into the pit and you like want to have fun you're like oh I might get my shit rocked like I don't know if I want to do that right now right. so it's scary and especially if like you're the only one of your friends that likes hardcore and you want to go to a show by yourself and you're a non-man and you go and you're like, Oh my God, I'm terrified right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like so much. And I'm so thankful that I have a lot of friends that I have made in hardcore that are so welcoming and like, just accept you and like, are like, yeah, you want to have fun. I want to have fun. Like, let's go. And like, yeah. I can go into a pit full of men and not feel like I'm going to get my ass beat. Um, and just like go in and do my thing and then like get out without getting like kicked in the head. Right. Um, but it can be so intimidating and mm. it's like definitely a lot. 
Yeah. And I, and I think like, yeah, that is a, a huge point of like, yeah, like I think the ability of being able, like I've had a lot of people on the show, um, you know, that talk about like, yeah, hardcore is so welcoming. And then the, I've had like very few people would be like, it is. And there's like some other stuff in the mix where we could do a lot better and like, you know, work mm-hmm. on that. Like it's, it's a never finished kind of, um, kind of state right so i do think that like being able to see you know more representation and that could be like like whatever that means that it could be like you know seeing a band like zulu like really kill it right now i think it's like so important for the next like two three five years of like you know seeing more people like feeling not intimidated that they can start a hardcore band and you know they're um they're a a black individual so i think that there's like there's power in that and i do think that is like it is that thing where like i don't think that you're wrong in being like well i don't know if it's in my head because i do think that like a lot of people naturally will just like look around and everyone's like judging what air maxes you own or like what band you play in or like what your t-shirt is and and maybe not intentionally but it is that kind of thing where like you know, people, it's like they are showing up as themselves, but like the trying to be like a certain version of themselves. Mm-hmm. Like very few people come into the hardcore space and they're like, you know, how's it going? And if they're having like the te- most terrible week ever, they can, they feel confident enough to be like, yo, my week's been shit, you know? And, yeah. you know, they could be whatever. So I think, you know, it, it's, it was a is a point that I wanted to bring up with you because I think it is like very, I think that constant questioning of like, okay, like, like do people feel welcomed here? Do we like elevate these people as much, if not more, than like all the cool like white dude beat down shit that like is like really popular right now? Like I think it is like so important to like really pause, take a step back, and be like, are we like? Are we doing the best that we could, I guess? Yeah. So at the show that we just played in Rochester, we opened for Taking Meds. And they aren't a hardcore band, but like they wanted space on it. And Deal With God played, who are from Syracuse, I believe. And they're also a hardcore band. So there were people there who were there for Taking Meds slash were probably just there because the bar had a band playing that night and just wanted something to do. And I'm all for that. And I had people come up to me after our set and they're like, it was so cool seeing not a man up there. And like this one girl was like, I want to start a riot girl band. And I was like, please. Oh my God. That is so cool. I was like, get your friends, That's like amazing. make a band, tell me about it. And then this other girl came up to me and she's like, this was my first hardcore show. Oh my God. This was so cool. And I like was telling her, I was like, oh my God, like get in hardcore, like go to shows. Just like the community is so welcoming because it can be. And, like, Mm -hmm. obviously, I'm trying my best to be someone who is welcoming. And, like, I just, like, I want people to enjoy what I enjoy, obviously. Like, everybody wants that. So to be able to have this sort of influence where people are coming up to me after and being, like, you did this to me that makes me want to do this again. And I'm, like, Mm -hmm. oh, my God, thank you. But, like, also, you're so cool. And, like, I hope you do this again. (laughs) Like, it's overwhelming, but in such the coolest way. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do think that it is like it's super I think that it is like that that these influential people and leaders based off of like them not being a uh a, a like a white individual like I think that they're it, it, and it's such a fine line cuz like on this podcast like I don't want to like force anyone to be like you know, like a question that I will never ask is like what's it like to be, you know, like I try to avoid yeah. that altogether. Um and but I do think that it is like super cool to like have that thing where it's like just because that you're on a stage playing to like 50 to 100 people and that that is enough for someone to identify and be like, yo, I can do that, too, because mm-hmm. like you don't see that with like someone who's playing in like a folk like group or like a blues yeah. group or like things. It, there's there's such a thing where it's like so like it just connects with you in a way where it's like oh I can do that and then you get like 
like a scowl band that is like exploding and like all these yeah. different artists that are like like I feel like some of the top artists right now are or are or sorry, I should say some of the top artists that are at the top of everyone's like radar are primarily aren't like filled with just only white guys. So I think yeah. that is like I love the state of hard that state of hardcore and I hope that that continues and just like grows more where it's like all like all the top 100 bands if someone actually made that list like I would want 50% of those to have some level of representation that yeah. isn't just yeah just I think that is uh I think we're on that path and I think having conversations and being able to have more bands and all those kind of things just helps us get to that mm -hmm. to that level and I feel like Scowl and Zulu are great examples because with Scowl, like Kat is not afraid to show off her femininity, which is something like I feel like a lot of non-men and like femme presenting people in hardcore struggle with because like personally, like I am she, they pronouns like uh, I consider myself a demi girl, but I still like to dress like a girl. So and her, she has inspired me to like be like, okay, I don't have to just wear a t-shirt and like dickies to a show. Like I can right. wear like a skirt if I wanted to, or like a crop top and like we do my hair and my makeup all cute. Like I'm allowed to do that. And Zulu is super cool because like hardcore is unfortunately like very white dominated. Mm -hmm. So like having just like a group of black people just like coming out and like doing their thing and like having black people come to these shows and be like, oh my God, there's someone just like me up on the stage. Like I could do that. Right. That is so important. And I just mm -hmm. hope that it only gets like more inclusive from now on. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's huge. Cause like, I think, you know, I I'm a big fan of cat. Uh, we've chatted a lot, you know, uh, off the podcast and just like big fan of, of her band and, and all the people in scowl. But I think that there is a lot of things where, you know, out of most people, like she was one of the first people I was like, oh, like, like Scowl's prom corset. Like she was wearing a dress and like cowboy, like, like yeah. boots like and like was two stepping. So I was like, cool. this is amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's so sick. Like I can, I can't imagine having to like perform in a skirt and like heels. And she just does it. And I'm like, oh my God, you are so cool. Like I just yeah. want to know what her closet looks like. It's got to be so cool. <laughs> Yeah, but I do think that it is like it all it takes is like being able to like feel that connection point to someone and that could be like anything as simple as like even just like the metalheads like seeing someone that looks that way or like someone that has the same skin tone or like anything that like goes into that and I feel like that helps like move the conversation forward and you know I you know based off that one show that you just mentioned like I do think that like you know the the little seeds that you can plant with people like like you never know and i love that curiosity of like maybe you like helped inspired someone who's going to start the next like big mm -hmm. like band that uh that has that like uh aspect of diversity so i love that yeah i love that like because. i can only hope that that's what i'm doing <laughs> yes no and you definitely are so don't ever feel like you aren't so that's great shit um you guys, um, do you guys have a t-shirt that says Dan sucks on it? I saw that oh my on, God. Uh, on your Twitter. <laughs> so, um, I'm like me and Dan both run the Twitter, which is so funny. And we made a shirt and it says this music sucks, put on some space. And it looks yeah. like a bumper sticker type of thing. And we're bringing mm -hmm. those shirts on tour. And I think we want to make bumper stickers. I don't know when we're going to do that, but it's in the works. And it's so funny because our friend Alex he and Dan just like have this weird like banter with each other where they like awkwardly pick on each other in the like most like wholesome way. Like I have no other way to explain it other than that. And so he photoshopped it and it said Dan sucks on it. <laughs> and I was literally crying because I was just like, he did this so fast. Like, yeah, I think we posted the shirts like and then like 10 minutes later, there was just that picture. Oh, man, he had his Photoshop just booted up already. He's like, it was Let so me funny. <laughs> Oh my God. I can't wait to tell Dan that. I, I saw the Dan sucks version first. And then I went to your big cartel and I was like, is it on the back? Like I was trying to figure <laughs> it out. So that's so funny. 
we'll we'll have to oh see. Like I'm a, I'm I'm a big fan of uh of the meme of the meme shirts. I I've been trying to push yeah, people that we'll come on the podcast now. to do Yeah, maybe you'll make one. And then you can send it to me and then I can like clip this part in the podcast and hold that shirt up and be like we did it everyone yes i'm gonna tell I, them like i would like, personally hey, like you know I'll, I'll personally put in an order of 10 so if that if that's enough <laughs> to get it going just let me know i will i'll definitely i'll let donnie know okay well lexi uh we can start to wrap up the show here um you know as far as like you know, space sounds like you guys have a lot uh, for 2022 plans. So, you know, for fans of the band and fans of you, um, give me a little bit of a rundown of like what people can expect. I'm sure there's more things that you can't say versus things that you can. But like, mm -hmm. you know, this is your time to kind of make announcements, uh, tease things or give allusions to to what's to come. So as of right now, and I'm sure that the podca podcast will be posted after this run is over, but we are going on a Midwest run with Broken Vow this weekend. We're hitting Milwaukee, um, Grand Rapids, uh, Springfield, and, and Cincinnati. Um, so that's what we have going on. But we also just announced a tour with Jell, who I am so excited to play with. And it's an East Coast run. So we're playing New Brunswick um i want to say it's like gardner massachusetts mm -hmm. and then i'm not sure where in connecticut but we played there already at wham leg it's like some vfw and it's like super sick so we're hitting mm -hmm. that up again and then we're gonna hit the studio and probably release an ep soon that's all we got planned right now dope Wh when do you leave for that uh broken vow tour um they get here in buffalo tomorrow night and then we're leaving very early thursday morning Okay, so leaving the 20th first show is on the 21st? Yes. Like, okay. Well, leaving the 21st. Wait, what's today's date? The 18th? Oh, we're, the first show is on the 20th. Oh, okay. So, so we're leaving we, that we'll day talk about this. getting there. Yeah, we can talk about this off air, but we could potentially drop the episode on the 21st if you want. <gasps> Oh my god, that would be awesome. <laughs> you know, we, we try to make quick turnarounds here at the Scoped Exposure Podcast. So, you know, now it can be out like, yo, space is on tour now. Go check them yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, that would be but, great. Of course, yeah. Well, um, Lexi, one of the final questions before we start to wrap up the show here officially is a favorite mosh story that you would like to share. And that could be anything oh, that first comes to your mind. That could be something that happened to you, something that you did, um, something that you just saw at a show. Um, whatever is the first thing to your mind is how we start to end the show here. I think, so this happened at the Buried Alive show in December that we played. Mm -hmm. And I was standing towards the outside of the crowd. I was like, there's some old heads here and they're trying to throw down for like the first time in a while. I'm going to let them have their fun. Um, I'm sure. just trying not to get punched in the mouth tonight. So I'm just chilling. I was like on the outskirts of the pit. And I remember Scott looks right at me and he goes, space, get up here. And I was like, fuck. I was like, okay, I'm coming. And I get up there and Donnie's in the pit and he looks at me. He's like, stage dive and get out. He's like, I don't want you to get hurt, but I know you can do that. I was like, you got it. As soon as the song started, I just like crawl up on the stage and I just jump. And then I like started this like stage dive chain, just like everybody was stage diving. And then as soon as the song was over, Scott was like, space, set that off. Like, <laughs> get up here. Like, I want to see more people stage diving. And I was like, thanks. Like, glad I could help. <laughs> and I feel like that was like the one moment where I was like called out by Scott Vogel and like had to do a stage dive. And like, it was fun. And I got to stay in the i didn't get hurt and it was fine yeah yeah <laughs> it's always funny to be like um you know at like demanded by scott vogel to uh to give him a stage dive which i've jokingly said it on the podcast that he's like i feel like if the minute that people stopped stage diving like he just like collapses and it's just like yeah it's just he's like, done. like step, because step i think he's powered heads. by stage dives yeah and i love that and uh, yeah, it, it, but it, I think it's also funny to like to not say your name and just say spaced like your band. You're like, well, I guess I could go by that. So yeah, it was funny because after the set, I talked to him. He's like, "What's your name?" And I was like, "Black." Yeah. Okay. 
<laughs> He's like, I should actually learn your name uh, versus just call you Space. Um, but no, that's a great story. Um, so Lexi, really appreciate you. Uh, big fan of Spaced. I hope that you guys uh, get to make it up to uh, Western Canada at some point uh, when some of this shit, you know, chills out a little bit. Um, anything you want to plug, shout out, uh, or send the people off with before we close off the show? The floor is yours. Um, Just want to plug to keep an eye out that we will have music out. Hopefully within the next few months. Uh, shout out to Buffalo Hardcore. Shout out to Broken Vow, who we're um, playing with this weekend. Shout out to Jell, who we're playing with in February. Um, yeah, very much looking forward to what we have in store for the future. And so just like follow us on socials. I believe it's just space underscore HC or space HC. We're both on Twitter and Instagram. Yeah, and all the links will be in the description and the show notes oh, and all that perfect. good shit um you know got to make it easy for hardcore kids that have very fleeting attention spans so shout out to anyone who's made it this far in the episode and shout out to you lexi for coming on the show here today yeah thank you for having me <laughs>